Hey everyone, Reese here, Control at Reese, and welcome to August 2020 Projects and Pickups. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept of this video, this is the second one that I've done. I put one out about a month ago just as a bit of an experiment to see if people would be interested in hearing some other stuff, some behind the scenes things on projects I've been working on, uh, some of the stuff that's kind of come into my possession. Uh, turned out that that video proved to be really popular, which is fantastic, and I'm really, really happy to be putting together another one for you this month. So in this video, I'm of course going to be covering my remodel of my YouTube studio slash game room slash man cave, whatever you want to call it. I'm also going to be giving you an update on the very latest on my Acorn Archimedes restoration. Uh, also some interesting Atari hardware that I've picked up over the past month, some games that I've picked up for my Atari ST and PC, and a little bit about PC, MIDI and DOS gaming. So if that sounds of interest, stay tuned and I'll see you the other side of the intro. <laughs> So first things first, and if you're a regular viewer of the channel, you'll probably notice that things have changed quite a bit around here. Now, I did touch on it very briefly in my Acorn Archimedes update video last week, um, but I think it's time we kind of finally showed off some of the stuff that I've been working on. So I've got some really good time-lapse footage of the build process of my new racking going in. So I worked my way along two walls of my room here and uh, just took out the old cubby holes that I had in here. I uh, took out the whiteboard that I put in for some reason when I first set this up as an office and uh, worked on the assumption that for some reason uh, offices needed whiteboards. I'm not quite sure why I thought I needed that and it was a massive waste of wall space so that's finally gone. Uh, I built all of this lovely new blue and orange racking from Rapid Racking which I'm sure you'll recognise if you've ever worked in a warehouse, uh, certainly in the UK. So the important thing to me is that I finally got all of my Atari collection on display. I have installed some LED lighting in the actual shelving itself as you can probably see but I'd like to do a bit more work on the illumination in this room and just uh, getting some more light on everything. Uh, I think at some point in the very near future as well I'd also like to upgrade to a new camera with a, a wider angle lens on it because there's some stuff I've put on a shelf above the area where I sit and record my videos and that's looking really really good but my camera just doesn't have a wide enough field of view to capture it and that's a real shame. So that's something I really need to look into in the near future. Now if you've seen my previous game room tour video, and I'll link to it up above and down in the description if you haven't, uh, you'll have seen all of the machines that I had on display here and the, my boxed software and games and things. Um, of course I will be doing an updated tour of the new room, uh, just explaining what everything is on the shelves. It's, it's all laid out so much better now, you can actually see stuff on display properly. Uh, I've also obviously acquired uh, a fair amount since then, so we can go over the new things as well. Hopefully that will be of interest and hopefully it won't be too much longer. So just to mix things up a bit, we'll do a pickup next, and one of the things that I picked up in the past couple of weeks was this Atari 410 program recorder, and this is of course the cassette deck for the Atari 800. I also have the floppy drive for the 800, and of course I have a flash cart for it as well. And uh, I do have quite a good collection of cassette-based games for the system. So the ultimate plan is that at some point in the future I'll put together a bit of a video on the Atari 800, and in that obviously I can briefly mention the various different methods of loading games into the system and uh, obviously demo them as part of the video as well so that should be really informative. Also just a really cool thing to have for the collection, you know there's not a lot of these cassette decks left and there's even fewer of them with the original boxes so yeah really pleased with that and it wasn't expensive and the seller did fully refurbish and test it as well so really cool thing to have. On the subject of rare and obscure Atari hardware, one thing that I have been into for quite a while now, but never actually covered on the channel, is these. Atari calculators. And uh, I pick these up on eBay occasionally. Obviously this is quite a nice boxed one, quite a big one. Um, but let's get it out of the box. Because you can't beat an unboxing. So we have some original sealed Toshiba batteries in there. And inside here we have this absolute unit of a calculator with the original film on the screen. Uh, so really nice desk calculator there made by Atari. Uh, well, I assume it's probably made by Epson or someone else uh, and just branded as Atari, maybe Casio, I'm not sure. I'll look into these and, and do a bit of a video on the history of these at some point. Uh, also on the shelf here I have this one that I got in the past couple of weeks. This is a nice uh, kind of clamshell design that folds shut. So really pleased with that one. And then just a couple that I've had for quite a while now. I picked up a while, while ago. Um, just uh, sort of smaller pocket calculator type things. 
Um, I really like this licensed, branded Atari hardware. Uh, and yet again, it's the kind of stuff that people aren't really interested in. And uh, you see it pop up on e eBay occasionally, stick a bid in and uh, end up getting those relatively inexpensively. So definitely something that I'd like to cover in future on the channel. So another thing I picked up that's also going to be a bit of an ongoing project for me and a subject for a future video is a PC MIDI card. Now this is also known as a hard MPU card and it's an ISA card that basically directly interfaces with MIDI devices like the Roland Sound Canvas that I have here. And you might think, well, the Sound Blaster 16 card that I have in this 486 has a joystick port on it which is perfectly capable of interfacing with the Roland Sound Canvas, so why would I need it? Well, the earlier Sound Blaster cards had a bug. Uh, essentially, it's called the Hanging Note bug. And uh, I'll show you an example now using level two of Doom and uh, having the Roland Sound Canvas SC88 hooked up to the output on the Sound Blaster 16. Uh, the music gets to a certain point and you can hear that there's a certain note that just gets stuck and that note stays on essentially forever. Um, of course, that's really, really annoying and it's due to a bug in Creative's implementation of the MIDI standard on the Sound Blaster cards. Now it's worth pointing out that this was fixed on later cards, uh, but because the Sound Blaster 16 is kind of period correct for this machine, I really, really wanted to stick with it. And this particular Sound Blaster 16 has a genuine OPL chip on it as well. So it's about the most authentic experience you can get uh, in this machine. So it's very important to me that I tried to hold on to it if I could. So we get to the same part in level two again using the PC MIDI card hooked up to the Roland Sound Canvas this time. And there's no hanging note. The music plays absolutely perfectly. So the second example, and probably the real reason that I actually invested in this PC MIDI card, is Dark Forces. Now Dark Forces is a Lucasfilm game. Um, the soundtrack is absolutely epic, obviously being a Star Wars game. Um, being produced by the actual, actual studio that made Star Wars, um, working very closely with the people behind the films. Uh, the soundtrack and the graphics and the gameplay are absolutely top notch. And it has a, a full orchestral score, um, very heavily inspired by the movies. And by far the best way to enjoy this game is using the sound canvas. And as you can hear from this music on level one, there is a hanging note again. Uh, this note gets stuck on uh, part way through the music and essentially it stays on all the way to the end of the level. Uh, you can get to the end of the level and press escape to end the mission and the note is still ringing out and then there's a really nice animated cutscene with some really fantastic voice acting which is completely ruined by a note that just continues to ring out all the way through it. Another sinister plot is set in motion that will become an even greater concern for the rebellion. Demonstration, General Monk. Thank you, Lord Vader. What I unveil today will mark a new era for the Empire. And the note doesn't actually become unstuck until you quit the game. <laughs> of course, that basically, again, makes it completely unplayable. Uh, so the PC MIDI card it really is essential if you want to play uh, older games like this with the sound canvas. It's just a much improved MIDI interface and it's definitely worth the investment. Now I am going to make a video on this card specifically and it's probably probably even going to be my next video. Um, so I'm going to be covering it in a lot more depth. Just how you can get it set up and use it in DOS and in Windows. Uh, how to get the drivers set up and get it working happily alongside all your other ISA cards. Uh, so watch out for that one in the near future. Just while we're on the subject of the sound canvas. Uh, this one is a Japanese import of course as the vast majority of them are. And it originally ran on 100 volts. Now, our mains voltage here in the UK is 230 volts. 
Uh, and there is a very, very simple modification that you can make to these so you can plug it directly into the mains here in the UK. And I started doing some research, uh, basically my 110 volt transformer that I use for some of my imported consoles and uh, stuff from the US and Japan is getting a bit long in the tooth and it's making a really horrible loud buzzing noise now. And it was annoying the hell out of me when I was trying to sort of enjoy the, the wonderful sounds of the sound canvas. Uh, so I started doing some research and I was going to put together a bit of a tutorial myself just on how to do the conversion. And I came across a really good video by a channel called The Retro Box Room. And I've been following this guy for a while and I do watch his videos. Um, you know, a bit of a fan of the channel anyway. Uh, followed along with it. It's literally 20 minutes real time just showing you how to move a couple of wires around internally. So I thought, well, I don't want to tread on his toes because his tutorial is really good and I, I don't think I could do a better job of it myself. Uh, so I will link to that up above and down in the description. Uh, and if you have an imported sound canvas, I can highly recommend doing the modification. That uh, means I don't need to put up with that horrible transformer anymore. And uh, yeah, it's been running really, really well ever since. So just briefly back onto a project for a moment. And if you watched my previous projects and pickups video, uh, obviously I said at the time that I was looking forward to getting stuck into this Acorn Archimedes and a lot has happened in the previous month. Uh, I put out a video last week just uh, giving an update on this computer which I'm now considering to be fully finished. Uh, one thing that I did mention in the video was that I'd acquired a different keyboard for the computer just because I'd had so many problems rebuilding the original. Turns out people weren't keen on that. Uh, this original keyboard is very much the right one for the machine. They're also quite rare. Um, so I decided to revisit that and just essentially use the parts from the new keyboard that I'd found just to get this one fully up and working. So the Acorn purists will no doubt be very pleased to hear that I'm now back onto this original keyboard with its red keys and the uh, BBC branding. And I'm very much looking forward to working with this machine and putting together another video on it. And the subject of that video will be an audio upgrade. So in last week's video, I just changed the op amp chip in the output stage of this computer. Uh, I changed it from the original inexpensive chip that Acorn originally fitted to this machine for a, you know, a nice higher end Burr Brown uh, op amp. Uh, I also put a bit of a comparison in there just using the Canon fodder intro. It's a very quick thing just to see if I could hear any difference between the two op amps and then I couldn't and uh, many commenters on the video also couldn't. I also had a couple of comments from people who have carried out this audio upgrade who said that it's absolutely essential that I do some further work just to remove some filtering that Acorn added just to make the most of the op amp upgrade. Now of course it makes sense that uh, if I'm doing that upgrade anyway I may as well put out a video on it. There's not really much information out there on that particular modification. Uh, and if all goes to plan, it should make a massive difference and should be really worthwhile. Now, finally, on the subject of the Archimedes, I started doing some research into joysticks. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, you're probably familiar with my One Joystick to Rule Them All series, where essentially I take a Neo Geo joystick, uh, this particular Neo Geo joystick, and I basically build adapters to try to connect it to as many different retro systems as possible. Uh, it serves as an example, just sort of as the basis for your own uh, joystick adapters, uh, joystick interfaces. And the selection of joysticks available for the Archimedes is very, very limited. It doesn't have joystick ports built in. Uh, most of the games do have joystick support. So I started doing some research and I discovered a project to allow SNES joysticks or SNES joysticks, uh, joypads to work with the Acorn Archimedes. And I thought, well, rather than buying a SNES pad and chopping it up and adapting it for the Archimedes, why don't I use that as the basis to do a one joystick to rule them all uh, video for the Archimedes, uh, which also means that I can cover the SNES and the NES. So I have the chips here. Uh, these are CD4021 multiplexer chips. I have a wiring diagram that I've put together uh, just in preparation for the project, so that video shouldn't take too long to put together. The other thing that I've acquired on the topic of one joystick to rule them all is this Neo Geo kidney bean stick. This is a later Neo Geo stick, and it's wired slightly differently internally to the other stick that I have. So this one requires five volts, uh, obviously uses some kind of um, maybe multiplexer chip inside itself. I'm not sure I haven't actually torn it down yet. Uh, this literally just arrived. Uh, but it also means that I can test my adapters from my previous videos and also my new adapters going forward just to make sure they are fully compatible with all of the Neo Geo joysticks. So uh, really great purchase there and of course like the other stick it has some really nice buttons and a micro switch joystick. So again 
just another cool thing to have. Now, while we're on the subject of hardware, I also got one of these, an Atari Lynx. And this is something that I've wanted for a very, very long time and just haven't got around to yet. Uh, as you can see, this is boxed. It's not in mint condition, but I don't tend to look for stuff that's in mint condition anyway. Um, I like stuff that's been used and has a bit of history and a bit of uh, patina to it. Um, so yeah, the uh, Lynx console here, boxed. We'll just have a quick unboxing. Try not to uh, damage it. It has the original branded carry pouch. Um, oh, got the instructions in here and a couple of games. Um, so the console itself is in really nice cosmetic condition. Uh, it has the original screen, so I will be doing a screen upgrade on it. I'm not quite sure which one yet. Um, I know a couple of the channels that I follow have done screen upgrades. Um, so yeah, something that I'm uh, something that I'm definitely looking at for the near future. Also, the two games that came with the links were Batman Returns, which from what I gather is actually a really good game on the system, and Blue Lightning, which is one I hadn't heard of. Um, if you have any recommendations for Lynx games, let me know down in the comments. Um, these are really, really inexpensive to pick up, and I'd probably like to start collecting boxed Lynx games uh, just because they'll look nice on the shelf, and there's not a huge number of them. I'm also aware that there is a flash cart for the Lynx made by Retro HQ, who made the Jaguar Game Drive, which I reviewed a couple of videos back uh, for the Atari Jaguar, of course. Uh, so that's something I'll definitely be looking into in the future as well. I've covered quite a lot in this video already, so I'll just quickly go over some of the games that I've picked up in the past couple of weeks. Uh, so the first one that I want to talk about just very quickly is Microsoft Flight Simulator. This is version 4. This would run really, really well on my IBM 5150. Uh, so I thought I'd put together a nice video just on the history of Flight Simulator, just saying, oh, look at this game, look how far we've come. Obviously, Flight Simulator 2020 came out in the past week. Turns out LGR had exactly the same idea, so I will link to his video up above and down below. As always, uh, I highly recommend you go and check it out. Um, basically, saves me a job. Um, but I will try this out on my PC at some point. I maybe I'm toying with the idea of maybe doing a live stream at some point, and I may well live stream this. So watch this space for that one. So while we're on the subject of PC games, uh, this is a original Quake CD, obviously, which I've had from brand new. Uh, but the box disappeared a very long time ago. Uh, I'm a really big fan of id Software and pretty much all of their games. I've been playing them, um, you know, since I was a kid. Um, so I decided to pick up a nice boxed copy of Quake. Uh, it should look really nice on the shelf alongside all of my Doom collection and Quake 2. And of course I will be picking up Quake 3 and Quake 4 um, to go with that in the near future. And now another game that I didn't specifically set out for and wasn't looking for, but it just kind of popped up and I thought, yeah, that'd be quite nice to have. Seventh Guest. Uh, interactive CD-ROM um, thriller, um, point-and-click adventure type game. Some really nice puzzles in this if you're not familiar with it. I mean, it was quite iconic back in its day, uh, but if you're not familiar with it, really, really great game. Um, and another one that I'd probably like to cover at some point, but yet again, just a personal favourite of mine and looks nice on the shelf. And I will, of course, be playing this at some point as well. So just moving on to Atari ST games. As you may know, I collect for the Atari ST and I'm getting a pretty sizable collection of games. Uh, so I picked up this one, which is Quick Snacks. And as you can see, this is Dizzy. Uh, it's the very first Dizzy game before they started putting Dizzy in the actual title of the game. Uh, I played a huge amount of Treasure Island Dizzy back in the day when I was a kid, and I have played most of the others. Uh, but I hadn't even heard of this one, to be honest, and uh, popped up on my radar and I thought, yeah, definitely worth a try. And it turns out it's actually some kind of puzzle game, I think. Um, this literally arrived just a couple of days ago and I've done zero research on it. So very much looking forward to checking this one out. I also picked up these Hit Squad games. Uh, these popped up on eBay, obviously someone selling off a load of old games that they'd found in their loft or whatever. Uh, these actually have a personal connection for me um, because I remember as a kid going to Toys R Us and my dad buying me these games. Uh, these are kind of the budget releases. Uh, so we have Chase HQ, really really fantastic game on the Atari ST. Uh, Bubble Bobble, one of my favourite games of all time, so very very much Looking forward to playing that uh, on the original disc. Uh, Batman. Uh, I actually own the big box version of this as well, which you'll see shortly. Um, R-Type. Really, really fantastic. This is pretty much the only release uh, that this game got on the Atari ST. Um, I used to play this quite a lot back in the day. Uh, I had it on a Pompey Pirates uh, compilation, uh, pirated floppy. So uh, apologies for that, but I do now own a legit copy. So uh, hopefully that will atone for my piracy sins. Also, New Zealand Story, 
Rainbow Islands, obviously sequel to Bubble Bubble. I also own the big box copy of this. I don't know why I need duplicates, but such is the life of the game collector. And uh, Whizball, which is a game which uh, my good friend Rob, uh, aka my retro tech, keeps telling me to check out on Instagram. And uh, this one's for you. So as you can see, I finally managed to get my hands on it, and I'm very much looking forward to checking this game out. So here's that big box copy of Batman that I was talking about. I picked this up a couple of weeks ago. Um, this was actually being sold in a bundle with Ghostbusters 2, and as a kid these were two of my absolute favourite games on the Atari ST, so really cool to have proper boxed copies of these two games, and uh, definitely games that I will be playing on my Atari in the very near future. I also found a copy of Voyager, and uh, I actually had this as a Hit Squad game, uh, funnily enough, uh, on that subject. But the really cool thing about the boxed version of this game, the big box version, as it comes with the soundtrack on cassette. And Voyager is not a really well-known game on the Atari. And this is a virtual reality game, essentially. It's uh, got some nice 3D polygons and stuff, and you're sort of flying around in this spaceship and exploring, and uh, just a nice 3D space exploration combat type game. My final gaming pickup for this month is Sleepwalker. Now, this is a game that hopefully needs no introduction. Uh, I actually played this on a friend's Amiga as a kid, but I've never actually played the Atari ST version. Now, the really interesting thing about this is this game is specifically for the Atari ST-E, and there weren't many games released that actually took advantage of the expanded uh, audio and graphics hardware in the ST-E. Uh, and of course, this one is a minimum of one meg of RAM, um, most Atari STs being sold with 512k. So, quite an interesting game, and I'll be interested to see how it compares to the Amiga version, Obviously being an STE game um, with one meg, one meg of RAM, um, I imagine it will probably be pretty much identical, so that'd be quite interesting to look at. So I hope you enjoyed this Projects and Pickups video for August 2020. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions on anything you've seen in the video, as always, let me know down in the comments section, always happy to chat. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. It helps me to grow my channel and helps to improve my visibility. Finally, if you've seen something in this video that interests you and you don't want to miss out on it and you're not already a subscriber, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. As always, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. get to my ship.